think this week's Raw fits into the category of redeeming. And what I mean is, even though it was still three hours, and for a lot of the show, it kind of felt like it was three hours, and it felt like a chore at times, and there were still plenty of stupid crap to frustrate and disappoint many of us as wrestling fans, there were also enough redeeming qualities sprinkled in throughout the night that it made it a little more palpable to be able to sit through this entire show. A really good show this was not. A passable Raw this did end up being. Hello everyone, this here Panda. You better get used to it, because I'm going to be around for a long time to come. I'm just sitting here looking all cute, chewing on your shoelace and snow cone need to get the hell up out my camera shot. All right, that's, that's fair enough. Now, here's, here's what I don't understand. Why the WWE love to use Dolph Ziggler as the second segment killer filler? You know, we don't need to see any more of these stupid six-man tags where the babyface always wins. This is, this is just bad. It's repetitive and unsatisfying, just like the majority of Raw matches or full killer TNA reviews. I talked before in a video earlier this week, you know, about what the fuck is the WWE doing with Bray Wyatt. And to me, it's ridiculous that they're sitting there and using Bray Wyatt when he's not even fully established himself and he's not even in the position he should be and needs to be to launch off a push for a Luke Harper. And now apparently we're going a step beyond that. Now, I don't know. Is Bray Wyatt hurt and we just don't know about it? Or is this really the WWE thinking that this is a good idea? Not only are they utilizing Bray Wyatt to launch off Luke Harper apparently on a singles push, now apparently he's also setting Eric Rowan free. Now I know some of you have seen rumors talking about they might bring up the Ascension and I'm sure that's going to give a lot of you chubbers in your short pant region. But again, how could you fuck this shit up with Bray Wyatt? Let's establish Bray Wyatt all the way first by association that will elevate Luke Harper and then even Eric Rowan. Now you're sending off Eric Rowan for a freaking singles push. That's the last thing he fucking needs. He's not ready for it. And as far as Luke Harper, he's not starting off nearly as far ahead of the game as he should be if they would have handled business properly to begin with with Bray freaking Wyatt. Hello, WWE. This here's Snow Cone. You better get used to me because I'm going to be around for a long time to come. Now, apparently, y'all think that body surfing equals breast cancer awareness. But let me tell you, if I wanted two drunk old sluts ruining my TV show, I could just go down to the bar and watch as all the drunk bitches try to hit on snow cone when I'm trying to watch Discovery Channel after dark. Couldn't we have used this time more wisely? I literally think I could have written out something better on a good poop in the litter box. This was terrible. I will say this, at least the WWE has backed off a little bit on the Nikki Bella, Brie Bella feud, especially now that you've removed Stephanie from the equation in terms of an on-screen presence. Now it's going to go into its more rightful place. I think the WWE realizes that, hey, it was worth it. We thought it was worth it at least, and it clearly isn't. But now you're just booking it like more typical stupid divas crap. You know, Breeze beating Summer with one hand tied behind her back. And I don't care if this ties into the whole shit with what Nikki had to go through when Bree quit. It's just, I can't wait for them to hurry up and get this feud done and freaking over with. And then even like the divas tag later on. Uh, what are they doing with AJ Lee? And what are they doing with Paige? This is just, just dumb. The WWE falling back into more dumb, bad, stupid habits when it comes to the Divas division. It, it's really sad. Now, apparently, WWE thinks that gator suits equal Brooklyn boners. Like, really? Who thought this was a good idea? This has to be one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. And if the crowd is chanting, this is stupid, you know it's got to be pretty bad. It's about as stupid as Daddy's haircut. Seriously, how long has it been? Time to go to the damn barber. 1988 called. They want their mullet back, honky. And then there were some other storylines, I guess you could say, that were advanced uh, based off of matches on this week's show. I really like what they're doing with Bo Dallas and Mark Henry. You know, the fans sit there and fully believe that there's no reason for Bo Dallas to ever beat a Mark Henry. 
but yet Bo Dallas keeps finding a way, his slimy Bo Levin ass, to find different ways and different avenues to be able to beat Mark Henry. This is the type of stuff that helps Bo Dallas shine. This is also the type of stuff that gets people kind of behind Mark Henry, I guess you would say. It really works for me. I'm like, I like what they're doing right now with this. I don't like what they're doing with Tyson Kidd and Natalia. This is total divas, total stupidity. Now, why do they always do dumb shit with Tyson Kidd? Look, I'm not even a huge fan of his, but even I can acknowledge he can go out there and at least put on a halfway decent match. And at some point in time, why not give him a chance to actually kind of stand on his own two legs and let him do something? Give him a chance, some chance, because what they're doing here gives him absolutely no fucking chance at all. Just makes him look stupid. I also like what they're doing with uh, The Miz in particular. You know, I love how the crowd was chanting for Sandow. You know, they're chanting for Mizdow versus Mrs. Batch with Sheamus, and that's all fine and good. But I like how the Miz has a stunt double. He has somebody out there to actually interfere. The interference actually happens. The heel beats the fucking babyface Sheamus. So simple, it's fucking genius. You know, Snowcone, this is kind of awkward. Daddy just leaves his stuff around. Yeah, I, I, I know. He, he kind of an awkward dude, though. But there's one thing we can agree on, Snowcone. What's that, Panda? Ain't nearly as awkward as Roman Reigns' interview. Oh, man, that was awkward. Oh, my God. He's back. Roman Reigns is back. Oh, what a hunk. I know it was just a small snippet. But it's a snippet enough for me. Oh, he looks so strong, yet sweet and caring and vulnerable. Oh, I love him. I want him back as soon as possible. And to all of you that are hating on Roman Reigns, he'll be back sooner rather than later. And you all be sorry. Hell yeah, bitches. Roman, love you. Love you, Roman. Call me. I can be your nurse. You could run my ears for therapy. Oh, I'd take extra good care of you. We could take long walks, and we could do some mowing stuff. Oh, you some mowing stem muffin. Love you, Roman. Call me. So about an hour and a half to two hours into Raw, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, oh, God, you know, the stuff with Ambrose and Rollins is pretty good, but the rest of this show is lacking. I don't know if I'm going to make it through the rest of the night. But then I hear Rusev's music, here's Rusev and Lana, and I'm actually a little bit hopeful because a lot of the stuff that they do with these guys on television comes across very well. And at this point in time, I think the WWE just needs to give us some good television, period, in any way, shape, form, or matter. So I'm sitting there and expecting they're going to do something with the big show, or Rusev's going to tease doing something with the American flag, somebody else might run out. But little did I know that The Rock was going to come back and rock Rusev. Look, first off, let me say kudos to the WWE for coming up with this segment. Kudos also to the WWE and The Rock for keeping this under wraps and having this be something that is very rare in today's wrestling business. A complete and total surprise. Very rarely do I legitimately like surprise pop anymore for anything involving professional wrestling or specifically the WWE. But this is one of these instances and this is one of these raw moments where I actually found myself doing just that. Where I was able to sit there for 15 minutes and just be a fan. What an awesome segment this was. This was really damn good. The Rock was The Rock. I'm kind of wondering, I'm like, where was this Rock in 2013 when he was the WWE Champion? The Rock was fucking on fire. He was clicking to me pretty much on all cylinders. And even at that moment where he thought there was going to be a little bit of a sputter from the most electrifying man in sports and entertainment, you know, he gathered himself and he delivered. You know, pulling your shorts up to your nipples, showing off your Moscow moose knuckle, shoving a smear off bottle up your Putin. Man, he was fucking on fire. This shit between The Rock and Rusev and Lana delivered. This was really damn good. Most importantly of all, this was just flat out good television. It truly was. And I also appreciate the fact that the WWE and The Rock kind of protected Rusev. They elevated Rusev because Rusev is worthy enough of having somebody like The Fucking Rock interrupt him.
It doesn't bury somebody. This is a way that you elevate a character. They didn't sit there and have him hit, you know, the rock bottom or the people's elbow or the sharpshooter on him. A few punches catching him by surprise, knocking him out of the ring, and Rusev's still standing, and he goes off. The fans have their moment, and then next week he can go right back to business. This was the type of good television, the type of spontaneous television that the WWE used to provide to us in great numbers that is far too lacking. Kudos to them and everybody involved for being able to keep this under wraps and giving us a truly pleasant surprise and again, some really damn good television. The one thing that it did do though, as it always does when somebody like The Rock comes back, is it reminds me of what a star is and what a real larger-than-life character is compared to what I get from today's WWE. It was also really cool to see Edge and Christian together a couple of times during the night promoting their appearance on the WWE Network and the 15th anniversary of SmackDown. I'm almost sitting there and I'm looking at these guys. I'm like, God damn it, these guys have really good chemistry together. God damn it, these guys are really funny. And God dang it, couldn't we get something with these guys more consistently on Raw? Maybe where they would chime in a couple of times uh, each week, like Waldorf and Astoria uh, from the Muppets, and they could sit there and freaking just poon on stupid things and have fun at everybody else's expense. You know, at this point in time, it wouldn't hurt anything. It would increase the entertainment value of the show. That's for damn sure. It was good to see these guys, too, along with The Rock this week. And now, even though the show started to pick up to me a little bit, and, you know, The Rock definitely saved this Raw for me, there was no question about it. Seeing Edge and Christian was also a good thing. We get to the main event, and I was really going to tune it out because, again, it was involving Cena Orton and yet another main event on opposite sides facing each other. The only reason I decided to stick through and watch it is because I wanted to see what Dean Ambrose was going to do. I wanted to see how they were going to bring him back to involve him and how the show was going to finish. So if anything, I consider that a great compliment to Dean Ambrose at this point that I have enough interest in what he's doing and what the WWE is going to do with him that I would even sit through a John Cena, Randy Orton match, main eventing a Raw in any way, shape, or form, even if I sat through that match in a kind of semi-comatose state. That, to me, is a compliment to Dean Ambrose, and I think a signal that they're starting to get on the cusp of something with this guy, and he could potentially be a nice money draw for their company. So I sit there, and I go through the match kind of comatose, just waiting for Ambrose to come save the day, and ultimately he did. Again, another cool kind of spontaneous thing that happened here, a show that so desperately needs this. You've got Ambrose pushing out a freaking hot dog cart. He's spraying Kane and Randy Orton with ketchup and mustard after he pulls him out of his freaking holsters like it's a freaking OK Corral showdown. You know, like he's Wyatt Earp or something. That shit was awesome. That was funny. But what was great about this was the way it ended. You know, you've been teasing, you know, babyface Cena versus babyface Ambrose. And yeah, they're going to give it to us. And I'll talk about my thoughts on that at another time. But I like how they ended the show after that kind of bombshell announcement. There's Cena. There's Ambrose. And Ambrose just plants Cena. And he doesn't plant him in a heel move type of way. He doesn't plant him in a heel turn type of way. He plants him in a lunatic fringe. Dean Ambrose, yeah, you guys should like me. I'm kind of anti-establishment. I'm the lunatic fringe. But fuck this guy. I don't like him either. So bam, Bob's your uncle. That shit was awesome. There's Ambrose standing tall to end Raw. You know... It was a good way to finish the show. And like I said, as far as this week's show, it was still a struggle through a lot of it. But The Rock saved this show for me. And in certain ways, uh, Dean Ambrose kind of made this show for me. I still expect the WWE to do a lot better. But if they could at least give me shows that measure up to this over the next several weeks, it will help my interest in their product at least a little bit because they're doing a lot of good things with Dean Ambrose and giving me a type of surprise like they did. You know, I can't expect that every week, but I can expect more good television than even what I got this week. This was a good start, WWE, but you still got a long way to go.